Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for David Burroughs. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. I guess I was a small boy in the 50s. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I wanted to make sure everybody that's here understands that this is not a Corvette seminar. We just happen to have Corvettes as some visual aids. Uh, but I do want to thank the people who brought them. Uh, Kevin DeWitt is right here. Kevin owns the, the blue car. And I did not have the pleasure to meet the person who owns this. Is that, is that, is that is, is he here? No, he's not. Oh, okay. Well, that's again, uh, Jonathan, our appreciation for that. This is, these, are, these are wonderful examples. I didn't see them until I got here this morning. Again, the fact that they're Corvettes is irrelevant to what we're going to be talking about. So if you like Packards or Duesenbergs or Mustangs, these still work just fine. As a matter of fact, I can give this presentation using Red Flyer wagons. I can use Smith & Wesson firearms. It makes no difference. What we do to be able to talk about things that are unrestored really applies to everything. So we're just taking it from the firearms business and furniture and toys and all the things that are collectible. We're taking that and bringing it over to the automobile side and showing collectors how automobiles may want to be treated in the same types of ways that people treat other collectibles. This is not for everybody, but this is something that a very unique part of the, of the Corvette or the, of the collector car community can relate to. Uh, what we will talk about today is some of the topics anyway. I've got it's a three-day presentation, so if you have, I assume you're all booked for the evening's hotel rooms, because this, this will go on for days. <laughs> <laughs> the introduction lasts an hour and a half. <laughs> uh, we'll try to talk about some of the topics, <clears throat> including what's, what's original? What's that really mean? What's unrestored mean? Uh, survivor. What do you do? What's the what's the easiest mistake to make with one of these automobiles if you buy one, uh, or if you're selling one? What's the biggest mistake or similar mistakes you can make? How do you avoid them? Uh, where's the where's the market going to go? What's been happening and why? Is this a growing market, a stable market, or a declining market? And why? I want to hear I want to hear questions from you. Uh, I want to get your input. And Bob gave you a little bit of background about what I do. I've got. Lots of years with automobiles. I've restored all kinds of automobiles. Um, my specialty is Corvettes, but I have an appreciation for everything. But I want to know a little bit more about who I'm talking to. Uh, can you just by show of hands, and we're not keeping track of them, but I'd like to know who in here already owns at least one unrestored vehicle. Wow, gee, maybe you should be up here. <laughs> That's very interesting. I've never done that with that many people in the room that already have unrestored vehicles. How many have more than one unrestored vehicle? You really should be up here. <laughs> uh, how many of you are collectors of things beyond vehicles? That's very interesting. That doesn't surprise me. Um, how many of you are not owners of, well, it doesn't make any difference. How many people are searching right now for an unrestored vehicle? Anybody in the search for one or actively actively looking or just if one comes by? We're always looking. Yeah, right. always looking. <laughs> so it's not <laughs> over yet. No. <laughs> that dream when you open up the, the barn door. Right. <laughs> when you've been looking. It's another shot in the air. Oh my god. Okay. Um, how many of you have had a bad experience with unrestored cars? really easy to have a bad experience with a restored car. How many have had a bad experience with a restored car? <laughs> That's a bad Usually that one goes much higher. Um, okay, two years ago, as a matter of fact, Mar uh, I just met Mark again this morning. Two years ago, two or three, Mark, I don't know how long it's been since we were at Collier. Miles Collier, does anybody know Miles Collier? Miles Collier is one of the foremost collectors in the, in the world. Has a marvelous collection. And every two years, he, he hosts a symposium with people from all over the country and lots of collectors and so forth. And the Kino brothers from the Antique Roadshow, anybody know Lee and Leslie Kino, who they are? The uh, uh, very interesting guys, very affable. And uh, he gave a credit, he and I both gave 
they and I gave uh, presentations at Collier's Symposium. And uh, Leslie, I think it was, described this couple that brought in a high boy chest of drawers. Queen Anne from the you know, 18th century, I, I don't know much about that, but he's got photographs of this high boy chest of drawers. It's a Queen Anne. And the couple, had, it, it, the couple inherited it from their relatives. And they were so proud of it, they brought it to the antique road show. And Leslie looked at it and said, this is absolutely gorgeous, stunning. And he talked about how he knew what it was and how he was able to match it to the period. And the long and the short of it was, he said, this is an absolutely beautiful piece of furniture. He said, I have good news and bad news. I said, the good news is, I would expect this to be worth $30,000. And they smiled. He said, the bad news is, if you hadn't refinished it, it would be $240,000. They said they, of course, dropped through the floor and never saw them again. But that's the message. A lot of people cannot get over the mentality of winning a car show or winning a trophy or getting some recognition. Our egos and our quest for perfection uh, goes over to something that's got a little nick on it. We have to, we just have to fix it. And we do that sometimes in a way it's destructive or devalues the, the property, whether it's a firearm, a toy, a, a packard, or whatever it happens to be. So the Kino brothers made a, a, an impression. And I think his numbers are probably exaggerated, but the point was, you would have been a lot better off if you hadn't refinished this. And once they refinished it, there's nothing they could do about it. So they can't, they couldn't back up. They couldn't reverse. So that's, that's what we want to talk about today, is if, if you get nothing out of here, you could leave right now, if you just took that piece of advice, if it's a piece of unfinished surface that hasn't been refinished, at least get more than one person with expert <coughs> ability to be able to tell you, is it okay to go ahead and do that? Um, so that's, a, that's, I guess, my main message that I want to get through. So if you go to sleep for the rest of the presentation, at least you've got, you got the main message now. I don't know. I don't see... You probably, can you see these? They're kind of small screens. Can you read those from the back row? Can you read that stuff? I can see it. Okay, all right. Uh, why, are, why are unrestored cars, original cars, gaining in popularity? And these are some of the reasons that there's more than this, I suppose, but these are ones that kind of came to mind quickly. Uh, we're seeing, at, at, at my experience anyway, more and more people making the transition from cars as things to drive and have fun with and go to cruises and transitioning into more of a uh, an object of art or an object of almost like a collectible that we see in other non-automotive types. Uh, a lot of people are getting bored with the shiny black lookalikes. You still see a restored car if you open the engine compartment up and look in there. The fender wells are the same color as the brake booster, or the, the master cylinder, as the control arms, as the brake. It's all the same color black, and it's all shiny. And you go from the Corvette to the Mustang, the Packard, and it's all like they're all built in the same place. So some people are saying, I've had enough of that. It's pretty, it's nice, and it's not means you shouldn't do it, but there's another alternative which may be more, a little more interesting, and that's to tell some of the backstories of the dings. Um, and to look at seam readout. What's seam readout? Why is that good? Uh, other th other people like this because, is it okay, Kevin, if I touch your car? <laughs> <laughs> You're in charge. <laughs> I do it, I won't do it with Kevin's, but I, I did do it with my, with my Corvette that I had. I did a demonstration. It was great fun to do. It got lots of attention. I won't do it, Kevin, I'll, I promise. Can I, can I open your hood, though? Absolutely. What I would do to make my point, I'm gonna block somebody out, but I would raise the hood like this, and I had a can of black spray paint in my hand. And I took a car just like Kevin's, unrestored, original, opened the door up, and I would step on the sill plate like this, and I won't do it, so don't, don't worry. He's going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> when somebody says they won't do it that much, they do it. And I would step right on the cowling right here with this foot, up on that, and then I had my other foot up on here. And I've got rubber sole shoes on and my can of spray paint. 
You do that in a car event, and you'll get a, an audience pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was mine. And when I, this was back in the 90s, I started doing this to show people. They thought, you know, you're, what are you doing? And I said, I'm not certainly not hurting it. I've got rubber sole shoes on, which I still do, so it's not going to hurt anything. This is built to have a huge amount of weight on it. It's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to crush it. I can stand there. There's a steel frame under that. I'm just resting my foot up here. So now that I've got your attention, my point really is I'm doing no damage whatsoever to this automobile. But I'll bet a lot of you have taken a $3 can of spray paint and sprayed your engine compartment black, and you just ruined all that original finish, and you can't ever recover it. You're the ones that did the damage. And that was the whole point. It's so simple how quickly you can ruin finishes. And it might not be restored. But it is refinished. And a lot of people have the impression that, well, I didn't change anything. I didn't remove any of the components. They're all the original components. So therefore, it's all original. Well, it isn't. You've refinished it. So whether it's furniture, a shotgun, a toy, a Packard, whatever it happens to be, once you put spray paint on there, it, it's going to be very unusual that you can get it back off again without ruining the original surface underneath it. And so that's a real that's a real concern is don't add paint to unrestored parts to make them look a little bit better. It's a real it's a real problem. And I do want to encourage you as we go along, if you've got a question, just just ask if we go over here. Yes. Okay. The question is, what can we do with these cars that were previously unmolested that will not damage the value of them? Good question. Basically nothing. Start with that, and we'll, and we'll come back around. You can't even clean the car? Yes, you can. You can clean, you can clean it, and we'll talk about some of those techniques. But I want to I want to do some other things first, but, but hold that, because I think are a lot of people interested in what you've got one of these things, what do you do so you don't make a dumb mistake? Yes. Okay. Hold me to that. If I am running low on time and we haven't covered it, pin me down and say, let's talk about some techniques. Yes, sir, you have one. Sure. Same question. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, the same as well, except with how much detailing can you do? How much cleaning? Okay. Uh, Just, that's a, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but the quick answer to it is, if you use Dawn dishwashing detergent and really hot water, you're not really going to hurt much of anything except unless it's paper. It's paper tags and so forth like that, hot water and Dawn will, will, do, will do bad things to it. If you've got grease and things like that, Dawn detergent's wonderful. I've been using it for 30 years in really, really super hot water. Mm -hmm. And then a nice brush, a paintbrush or a stiff bristle brush, just make sure it doesn't it isn't scratching. And that's that's the most you want to go. <coughs> in some cases, mineral spirits, but you have to be very careful with mineral spirits because it's petroleum-based. Using mineral spirits on a General Motors product, it's a petroleum-based, it's not paint on the chassis, it's petroleum-based, it's basically tar. It's called paroquito, used for preservatives in World War II. General Motors used that all through the 60s. You use mineral spirits on that, it'll just dissolve it and it all runs off and you'll never get it back again. So mineral spirit, even something as mild as mineral spirits, you can put your hands in, it's not going to hurt you. It'll ruin your finish. Yes, sir? In the uh, painting world, you can, there are restorers that can take off improper finishes. They've been doing that for 100 years. So if somebody's put spray paint in their engine compartment, can't you have that, that taken off without damaging the finish that's underneath just like in painting? You, you can, but somebody really has to know what they're doing. And I would say most restoration shops that I see are, are not mentally there yet. They don't have the proper approach to it. I, re, I spent one whole summer removing Rust-Oleum red primer with Rust-Oleum blue paint on top of the red primer. It was on top of a 2,000 mile original automobile. Just, and they did this when it was two weeks old back in the 60s. So it had been there for years and years. I got it off, but I, there was lots of experimentation. And how I did it won't necessarily work for you because if they put a different paint on it, the stripper that I use and the procedure I, will, I use won't work. So it's hugely tricky to do that. can be done. The other problem is sometimes people ruin the original finish by putting the other finish on. You can't peel it off like saran wrap, get reactive with the other paint. So you can't, you just can't get it off. There is a, there is a technique, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, called reversible paint. Are you familiar with that? You can actually put the paint on and take it back off again. 
that's that's something that the Smithsonian is doing, Miles Collier is doing it. It's a very important thing, and we'll we maybe get into that a little bit. The Smithsonian's been doing that with microcrystalline wax. So there are some tricks you can do that with. But the main thing is don't paint, don't use anything stronger than mineral spirits or gone detergent unless you've got adult supervision. <laughs> One more. I have a question about uh, stickers, uh, decals. Huh? Um, like, say you have a old Corvette and it's got a, maybe a parking sticker from the Air Force Base or yeah. the University. And it kind of tells the story of the car. I mean, I always, I hate to take that off. But when you judge that as a survivor, do you, you penalize the car for that? Or? Don't see it. You don't see it. So it's, it's part of its history. Be it, be it. In our philosophy, that's part of the car's history. Um, if you go to a car show, we, we call our event, our the Survivor and Zenith Collector uh, car event we have, we make sure everybody understands it's not a car show. You don't, get, you don't get trophies, we don't, there's no winner or loser, we just grade you. And that is not anything that, that has really changed, it's reversible. We think that's more important for the history of it. Yeah. Now, if you just put something on there yesterday for the Green Bay Packers, yeah, you probably, <laughs> especially in the Chicago area. <laughs> yeah, be walking home. <laughs> we, comp yeah, we confiscate the car. <laughs> uh, okay, the other kind of thing we're seeing is that people, why people are doing this. It's the hunt. You know, you, you put an ad. I've I challenged somebody. Put an ad for your favorite automobile in Hemmings or some eBay or where you want to go and say, I'm looking for a beautifully restored, accurate 396 Chevelle. How many responses do you think you'll get? Everybody's got one. Say, I want the same Chevelle except I want it unrestored and at least 90% unrestored and most of the finish is still there. Now, how many responses do you think you're going to get? One. one. Very few. Very few. That's what I'm trying to get across is every time you restore something, you just took that automobile out of the pool and you made everybody else's unrestored car that much more rare. So the more we restore, the more we make the unrestored ones more rare. It's just simple math. Guess what more sophisticated collectors want? Do they want more common things? Do they want more rare things? More rare. That's where, that's where collectors naturally gravitate. They're going to go to something that's more unique. It might not be as pretty, but if it's got something that's got intrinsic value, integrity to it, and that's rare, the market's naturally going to shift there. Yes, sir? When does the unrestored car tip over? We'll talk about that. Okay. We'll, we'll get to that. Let me ask one quick question about surfaces that got altered the day that, you know, the day it got delivered to the dealership. Undercoating. Uh, East, I'm from California. We don't have, we didn't have too much of it, although we did some cars. But on the East Coast, that's got to be more of a common, well, there's the document that says undercoat it before it leaves. What's that do? Before it left what? The dealership. You know, I mean, the day the guy buys that's the car. That's the dividing line. Factory is what we're looking for, because that's the true definition of factory. Where's the factory? Yeah, where's the factory? The factory means at the assembly point before it gets off the trailer into the car dealership itself. Hey, so obviously, out, our definition is out of the gate of the factory. Okay, and not out of the dealership when this person is No, and there's a reason for it. No, I just because there's so many variations of dealers, you drive yourself crazy knowing, well, this dealer in California did it this way. Right. We call that add-on. And what my you? buddy, he had that done. Well, you know, we don't know your buddy and how that was done at all, but we do know in in a reasonable degree of certainty how it did leave the factory, and that's a good point. And here's what it brings up: the person who says. Well, I've got undercoating from the dealer. They say, we're sorry. Say, well, that's not fair because I live in the East Coast and all the dealers did that. They say, we understand that. And that's, we hate that, that's too bad. <laughs> but nonetheless, when you look at two cars on the platform, this one has no undercoating on it because it came out of California. And this one does. Which one do you want? The undercoating. Well, sure. Right. So we're not, we're not, we're blind. In terms of who you are, we don't care if you're Reggie Jackson or if you're who you are. It makes no difference. We don't judge people. We judge what we're looking at. Better to find non-Z-barded cars. Yes. Now, it doesn't mean you can't qualify, but you're just qualifying a lower yeah, level. Right. I mean, that's been on there. It wasn't done last week after right. you bought it. Right. Yeah. It was any, any could be an extra mirror. Corvettes did that a lot. They put a, uh, right. another mirror okay. on that side. Won't work. 
Uh, but we have to also put things in context. That doesn't, just because it's got a mirror on this side, we don't say, oh, this, this beautiful old Corvette now has a mirror on that side. Oh, well, I can't recognize this anymore. We have to keep things in perspective. That's very, very important. Um, the other thing is, I think it's very important, and you all need to know this, in, in my view. A lot of people today, it concerns me as a car person, and it shouldn't, it should concern probably you as collectors, is there's a lot of stuff being done in the Corvette world. I don't know what it really is too much out there, but in the Corvette world, there's a lot of funny business yes. that goes on. Okay, And it's not positive. Uh, sometimes it's done and there's no intent meant by it. person just didn't like blue, so they painted it black. Now, there was no intent to deceive there, but they painted it black because they liked black better. But it's simple. You simply open the door, look inside, and see the paint code calls for blue. So, not really a big deal. But, not only that, they like the black, but they don't want to, they know that's worth more money if it's black. So they change the trim tag and make the trim tag match the paint. So now we have matching numbers, right? It's ridiculous. Who cares? Matching numbers means nothing, necessarily. So, what we're trying to get at is, there can be modifications to it, but there's a bit of limitations. But once you start changing tags and, and doing that kind of stuff, you've just crossed over into a, into a bad area. So, point of it is, people are, being, are getting tired of being tricked. And they get nervous about seeing a silver with red interior or a black with red interior, the, the really super popular colors. And they say, I love this, but I'm just afraid that this really wasn't silver. It really wasn't red. But, God, it's gorgeous. How do I know? And the answer is, I know more about Corvettes than probably a lot of people do. And I can restore them very nicely and I can preserve them. I would have a very difficult time, quite frankly, telling you whether this car was put together from pieces or four, five, six cars. Or if this was always came like this, it's just always it's just been refinished. There's really no way to conclusively tell that. A lot of people say, I just don't want to do the hassle. I can look at this after 30, 40 seconds. I can just flat out tell. I know exactly what this is. It doesn't even have a book of paperwork. There's so many, there's so many telltale signals on here of things to read that make it obvious what it is. More and more people, I think, are starting to figure out, I'll take the sure bet rather than the beautiful car that looks great, but I just don't know for sure if it really is. There's no paperwork to go with it. And even if there is paperwork, what does that prove? Paperwork. Authentic paperwork from somewhere. <laughs> but we still don't know that. Now, does that mean you shouldn't buy it? No, it doesn't. It just means more and more people are starting to say, I think I want to go with the sure bet, because there's no doubt about one that's really truly understood. They're great drivers. I made a comment to somebody, Rob or somebody, this morning. I never saw this car. I saw it once in 1990. I saw it again this morning. I will get in. I would bet. I could get. I'd bet with your money, Kevin. I would get. I could. I could get in this now, and I would almost bet you with great certainty I could drive this back to Illinois and have no problems whatsoever. A restored car? I wouldn't do that. Now, it might work. Just might work even better than this. But unrestored cars drive so well, and the reliability is so good, especially if they've been driven a little bit. They've been sitting for a long time. That's a different story. So they become they're great drivers. Nothing drives like an unrestored car. They're just nothing but Yes, sir. Yesterday, at the, what they were talking about was get out and drive. The, uh, you got a car, don't sit it around. How much does that devalue? How many miles you put on an original? Does it or does it? If you have a car at 12 miles, 12 original miles, from the 1960s, every mile you put on it will degrade it. A car like this, what's it got on? 80? 88, 929. Okay, so 90,000 miles. <laughs> How many tents? <laughs> 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 car like this, this can pass for a 40,000 mile car. I've seen cars like that in a much lower range. I won't hurt it at all. As a matter of fact, I'd much rather recommend to a client, if I knew this has been driven, way better than the one that hasn't been driven for 20 years. There's all kinds of other gremlins that will pop up. Like, My question isn't about finish, it's about things that can make a, uh, uh, invisibly make uh, an unrestored car um, a more reliable driver. Things like 
an aluminum core radiator so it'll cool better, uh, changing the polarity of the, um, uh, the electrical system so you can put in a solid state so that the damn thing will start. And I'm asking that in the context of English cars, uh, where you know they will overheat and they're sometimes hard to start. That's almost invisible, but it's not original, and it certainly makes it a better driver. What's the what? How do you see that trade off? Can you reverse it? I'll keep the parts. Can you reverse it? Could uh, you put the radiator back into it? Could you put the other ignition back into it? Correct. Yes. Good. Okay. The main thing is if so you, you, can, you keep the old parts and absolutely. Okay. You, even if they don't work, you keep them. <coughs> now there's a point at which you say this is getting silly. There's a, there's a, there's a, there is a line of silliness. Now I will admit one of the things I did that was really silly, but I'm not. I might not tell you after all. <laughs> um, there's a point at which you throw stuff away, but I can tell you I've thrown things away that then a year later I wish I had it back. Not because it's going to work, but I can get the configuration and dimensions off of it that I might need for something else. So those are really important. But if you're going to make it just more roadworthy, because the radiator maybe has a little leak in it, and this particular radiator is, is typical, these Corvettes, aluminum, if they would corrode and they start to leak or something happened to them, my suggestion would be, yes, take it out, document it. Now, again, it depends on where you want to draw the line. I take pictures before I ever take anything apart, photograph it, Take a shot as it's being taken out. Take a shot of it on the bench. That goes in your file. Take your other radiator, pop it in, go drive it, and have yourself a great time. When you decide to sell it or whatever you want to do, take it to our event. You simply lift that radiator out, put it back in. Or if you don't put it back in, in our event, it won't make that much difference anyway. We'll catch it, but it won't necessarily disqualify. So you have to use some common sense. The thing is, don't do anything that's irreversible if you can help it. So you keep your old bias flies and oh, yeah. know you drive radios. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Because those are archivally archi is that a word? Those are important. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's a very good question. Very important. Yes. I've got a '65 Roadster original car. It's Corvette. Corvette. Corvette or what? Corvette. Okay. Yeah. And the '65 had just that one seam down. That seam broke. The stitching came loose on the oh, seat your seat. Bottom. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, I didn't want to replace the seat covers are in good shape on it, and I had that re-stitched. Was that a bad thing to do? Just fine. Okay. And that's that's I'm making my stomach awfully nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I spray painted on the inside of the wheel wells. And, oh, why, why, why would you do, do that? that for? Why would you do? Why would you do that? Think about it. Why would you do that? I, I guess I didn't realize, you know, the car has 50,000 miles on it. It's a power glide, radio delete car. Right. Well, don't I think, think it's your, I don't, the point is, it's not you. We all do that. I wanted That's to be clear. That's how we learn. Nice. Right, because if, if, if it looks nice, it's a good reflection on us. If it's got, if it's got stuff like this old junker's got. Well, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you, you just don't want someone to come up to and say, hey, did you know this happens all the time? Hey, did you know this little, you got a scratch right here? Yeah. You know yeah. That? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, oh, we've got a couple of them over here. Are you not, uh, you could use touch-up paint on that, or you know, yeah. you just spray the whole, you know, what do you do there? And uh, you don't have any paint at all on this little flag. You know, you can get these Long Island Corvette cells. That you can get brand new ones, and they look, even, they look great. And they even fit better than these two. That's, that's, that's what you get into. That's why you have to be really careful going to car shows. Uh, They'll make you feel bad? Well, A, they can make you feel bad, and B, they can give you misinformation or such confusing information. You go back and this is what the judge said, as if the judge had some sort of PhD in, in archaeology or something, and you go back and you do that, and then you've done something that's wrong. So my point is, don't even listen, you know, I'm up here talking to you as if I knew what I was talking about. Don't even listen to me until you listen to three or four other people and say, am I getting kind of the same story from everybody? Okay. Don't just, just because I say something, don't necessarily do it. Except my one best piece of advice, don't do anything until you really do know what you're doing. But get more than one person's opinion. Because okay. we don't always even agree. So that's, that's an important thing, is don't jump off the deep end too quickly. Uh, 
and which I just got through saying. One of the problems that I'm seeing is there's lots of misinformation and misunderstanding that people get from experts, experts that really don't know what they're talking about, or show car judges who are judging a car like this. Very dangerous. More cars have been restored because of incompetent or maybe mismatched judges with the automobiles that they're judging. And people go home and they just ruin them. That's where I got the idea of creating Survivor. Um, it was because people were taking automobiles, bringing them to our certification event, and they would go home with a silver certificate. And that meant it was below nine. Gold certificate was 95% and above of the way it looked at like the factory. That's pretty hard to do. And they were bringing cars like this, maybe a little bit, a little bit more deteriorated than this. And they'd do great on authenticity, but the damage and deterioration part would put them below 95%, put them maybe down around 93. But you got a silver certificate because it was between 90 and 95. So what would people do? You've got to get that gold certificate because I'm you know, less than a first class citizen if I have a silver certificate. I can't tell anybody at home. You know, I've got to get this thing. <laughs> you don't take this certificate. Don't even talk about that. The trailer broke down and never made it. So what we do is we have the whole thing stripped and repainted. We bring it back, we get our gold certificate. Why? Well, because I didn't I didn't get the prize. And so we got we had to recalibrate what the prize is all about. So we created a show called Survivor. And we had definitions for it. And then people could bring cars like this back and they weren't penalized because it was deteriorated. Uh, we actually gave them credit for it. So that's that's an important thing. What I my job today is to keep those misunderstandings where someone gives you the impression you should paint the fender wells or fix these scratches. My goal today is to help you be surprised in a good way. There's some things you can do, maybe some things you didn't know, maybe some tricks you can use when you go look at these automobiles. I want you to tell me what this means. You see an ad. Tell me what that is. Describe the car. Describe that, please. <laughs> Uh, it looks like a junker. <laughs> Driving down the road, slavery. <laughs> How old is it? How about that? Yeah. Uh, 1967. 67. Oh. It's on its a and, and we're going to drive this car. I didn't say that. Right. Just, <laughs> look at it. <laughs> That's an ad. The last line, especially in, in adjacent to the first one. Yeah. Say it again. I find the last line a little, uh, the lady doth protest too much, uh, given the top line. It's either unrestored and therefore it's, in, I mean, it sounds like the interior has been done. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I would infer that. What's the original? It doesn't say original. You didn't have to say it. It's really uh, it doesn't say original. It says authentic. What's there? Opposed to original being the, the way it rolled out the door, you know, in Detroit. Because so, you can buy, you can buy, you know, Wall Street, it looks like it was made in 1960. Today, you have somebody, you know, make a seat cover, which would make it original, only authentic. Or it came out of another car. Yep. Read, the, read the problem to yourselves. Misunderstanding is based on ambiguous language. You know that the 500 most common words in the English language have 114,000 different meanings? <laughs> so it's really easy to say something, and you heard it, and you interpreted it your way, but I knew exactly what I was saying. We both use the same word. Me and my wife. <laughs> <laughs> The last one, real paper. Uh, yeah. A Marty real report paper. is a real piece of paper. That's probably what they're saying. You know. Yeah. So. What? Anybody else? Well, it, can't, it can't be original if it's been restored. Exactly. 
Are, are, we also, are we also not demonstrating that the average motorhead didn't do that well in high school English and, and maybe <laughs> some <laughs> other choice of words? I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote that way. <laughs> Average car artist is trying to sell a car that isn't what it is. You're a, in his mind, you're a tough crowd. Okay, here's an obvious. What do you got here? Just Google the authentic. Read a couple of them. No. I'm gonna screw up my sales pitch. What do you got here? I have that car. Maybe. It could be my aunt. Could be. I just bought it. Couple months ago, three months tell us, ago. tell us about it. Well, that's why I came here now, because it's it's been sitting for 26 years so, in a garage. Well, let's, I'm gonna hear more about that in a moment. But if you saw me with that other aunt, would you call me and let's get another one? I call it on that one. <laughs> How about this one? What's that's that? One. What's that say to you? It says it's been sitting or been untouched. All original. Untouched. All original super super survived. Everybody agree? How about that? Reserved. That means that they've done things to enhance it to make it look better. No, that means it just good. maintain it. That sounds good too. No, no. Preserved. Preserved means something. You're going to have to call these people and tear them apart. You got to call. You would have to call. I think everyone in this room, if we saw that ad, we'd probably call that guy and then figure out. I think it's very subjective. Everything you see is subjective. Right, subjective. There's key questions you ask the person directly. Yeah. Well, let me ask you reverse. Would this get your attention? Yes. Yeah. 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 Would that get your attention? Yeah. Would that get your attention? Yeah. Really? It gets my attention. Well, not for an unrestored car. Would that get your attention? Yeah, I'd call yeah. that one. Yeah, you asked the right question. <laughs> yeah. How about that? Certified. Oh, yeah. 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 You see the little circle R on that? Yeah. 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 There's only one place you can get that. Anybody uses that? It's a federal offense. You put that in your ad, you're going to be in federal court. Even if you oh, no. no, if you've got if you've got that, you're free to use that in any way you want. But that has a meaning to it. What does that mean? No, it depends on what it What is that? It's your trademark. What 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 does that mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? Does anybody, does anybody ever heard of that? No, no. So who has heard of it? Who has actually seen that before? What is it? Do you know what it means? What does that tell you? It's just been judged at Bloomington to be a survivor. Oh, the survivor authorized event. Starting in 19. And what does that mean, survivor certified? What, what does that describe to you? Anything? No. It still doesn't mean anything? Anybody ever heard of it? Yeah. No. Yeah. Heard of it. You haven't heard of it. Yes. But don't quite know what it means. You don't know the exact criteria unless you're, I guess if you have a Corvette and you have that on it, you'd know what the criteria is. Is it possible to get a Packard survivor certified? Yeah. 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 Sure. How about a uh, pickup truck? The GMC pickup truck. Sure. We hope. We're hoping. Yeah, yeah, you can. Let me, uh, let me go back here a little bit. Misunderstanding or misinformation. There's the ad. Here's the car. After you inspect it, I inspected it for you. You sent me out to look at it. Here's my report to you. What do you charge? <laughs> I'll tell you after you hear this. <laughs> Let your conscience go. <laughs> Chassis rusted and corroded with no visible remnants of finishes left at all. Engine and transmission uh, were restamped to carry the right matching numbers. And the interior was transplanted from a donor car into it. That ad is 100% accurate. Except. It wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't pass survivor certification. Though. Right. No. But people will call it a survivor because they have a they have an unusual way. They they don't know what they're really talking about. Key thing is, it's a hundred percent unrestored. It is a hundred percent unrestored. It's a rusty nail. Did you ever see a rusty nail? Yeah. Hundred percent unrestored. But there's no finish left on it. But it's unrestored. 
but it's all corroded away and it's all down to almost nothing. It's 100% unrestored. That's exactly true. Survivor, people use survivor all the time having no idea what it means. It's very dangerous to take somebody who says it's a survivor. And whether it's got an uppercase S or a lowercase S, when I speak to you, am I speaking with an uppercase or lowercase? Okay, it makes no difference. People use survivor generically, inaccurately. So, didn't mean to mislead you, but it, that's what it is. All original numbers matching. Their numbers matching all right, because I made them match. It's true. And a genuine, authentic interior, sure is. I took it out of his, put it in this one. So it's absolutely true. All that is absolutely true, no misinformation. But we all misunderstand the words because the words are so ambiguous. Okay, very dangerous. Yes, sir. I disagree. Unrestored, would, to me, would mean that you didn't take and put new upholstery in it from another car. It's <laughs> not being restored when you move the upholstery from one car to another? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I wrote the ad. didn't mean that to me. Okay, to me it does. Right? right. That's my point. It's unrestored because you haven't fixed it or done anything yeah. to it. I just right. transplanted not, not really authentic because you're taking part right. from some other car. The, the, the point I'm trying to make is be really careful when you read ads. Because people use words that they sometimes know exactly what they're saying, know exactly how to walk that tightrope to make it sound good. That they don't go to court. That's what the key is. Well, they, that's right. Because if, if you word it right. If you say that's legal, then. Well, it's, it probably is. Yeah. Here's the restored original. That actually is a term that people do use. It's contradictory, but people use it. it restored means, to original. Maybe. Yeah, this is restored original in some people's definition. It's hard. How do you restore something and have it be original? Well, that's some people's definition, not ours, but it's important to know that. Here's what my report would say when I came back and looked at this one. This is a complete derelict. It's a rollover. All areas are dented, scratched, bent, chassis is completely rusted, the radiator was crushed, interior is absolutely flawlessly perfect. But misleading, misleading uh, uh, ad, because it sounds that, uh, got real paperwork, and I didn't forget to mention that uh, the uh, the paperwork is real. So it's a true, true ad, but it goes much beyond what you see right there. So that's that's the thing I'm trying to get across to you. When you read advertising, it can be very misleading. Here's the all original Superbird. Although most of all the parts were the ones that were on the car when it left the factory, all components and the exterior were completely refinished, repainted. And the owner used the survivor definition as a generic description because he just didn't know any better. Um, so even though it's accurately painted, it can no longer be proven that it wasn't a, what we call a pizza. Whenever you see a car that's been totally restored, the owner can say, this was a perfect unrestored car when I started. And I simply took it all apart, refinished it, put it back together. Do you have photography of that? No. Because the shop did it. Does the shop have photography? No. So how do I know it was the original car that took part? Well, it just is. So falls through the floor. Understand? See how tricky this? So that's what I'm trying to get across to you is these things are very ambiguous. People use very ambiguous terms. That's one of the downsides of authentic and original automobiles is you have to be very careful when someone describes it to you what their definitions are. Everybody that I know of in the collector car world is using completely ambiguous definitions, whether it's RM, Barrett Jackson, Gooding, etc., etc. Most people who write the descriptions aren't the auction company, it's the owner. And the description's only as good as the owner's going to write it. The owner can either be ignorant, not intending anything negative, or they really do know what they're doing and they write the wording just on the other side of the, just on the inside of the law. So they say it's too bad, but it's up to you, the buyer, to have your inspector or you know what you're looking at. Uh, these are some important things I would like to leave with you. And there is there are handouts that I will give you all. It kind of has all this stuff summarized. Numbers matching, what's that mean? Nothing. I can make numbers match on anything. The question, if someone says the numbers are matching, 
I'm going to trim them down. Will you sign your name on this affidavit that says that engine is the one that came in and out of the factory and hasn't been replaced or restamped? Will you sign this? How could you? How could you? Unless you, unless you bought a brand new one. Unless you did or I would sign this one. I can look at this and tell you. Who's mm -hmm. that came out of it? I signed your name to it. So someone can know this broaching mark. You are good enough to say, I guarantee that one was in there. There are people yes. that good. Yes, sir. Because that's the thing right now, this numbers matching stuff. Is right, it's what, that's my point to you. If you leave this, I just want you to understand, don't just take someone's word for it. Uh, get somebody that really knows what they're doing. And it isn't bad, even if this engine didn't come in this automobile. It still isn't terrible. You just want to know it. Yeah. And there are ways to know that. There are also things that are inconclusive. There are things that can be done to this engine pad that don't look exactly kosher, and then I might have to say it's inconclusive. I'm not saying it is, not saying it isn't, it's just inconclusive. I may have to say that. So not every car can get you know, a complete slate. Uh, so it, it has to be done with care. Yes, sir? I was in a machine shop just earlier this week, uh, having some estimates made for my, my British car. A guy came in with a basket case Corvette block and um, a broken camshaft, a beat up crank, and a pair of rods and beat up pistons that had one of them had come through the side. Not of the block, but of the pan. And <clears throat> the, the machinist was saying that if we have to deck the engine, the brooch marks or you know the codes on this on the top of the block are right. going to disappear. Yes, they will. He says, but I see the casting number is correct to your numbers, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. He says, well, I have a friend, or I know of a guy, who could come in and re-stamp yeah. this <laughs> <laughs> just like from the factory. Yeah, no, it's not. Now, what, it is the engine, it is the right one. What, you know, is that? It's called a big mistake. A big mistake, an illegal? If you took the numbers off of it and put the numbers back in, in some states, that's better. Mm -hmm. They're correct, though. Yeah, but don't modern day machine shops, I mean, it's my understanding, some machine shops do the right ones, they can deck that motor out, they, they can stop short of that stamp. Well, I would think that that would be the way to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, because that's sticking it, out beyond the head yeah. anyway. Yeah. Every right. state is a little bit different. I'm not an attorney, uh, but we do a lot of that more in Corvettes. But if you, if you change the bin, well, no, saying, in this case, if, if you restore it, if you re put the same yeah. bin back into it again, as long as you disclose it, it's legal. Yeah. Well, I know when I brought my British car here to Arizona from California and restored it, uh, had it painted, then went down to get my tags, the guy said, it looks like you pulled the bin cat, you know, the commission number tag on it. And I said, well, yeah. And he said, well, you know, that's a class B felon here, or whatever he said. And I said, well, no, this is off I the didn't car, the engine. Off, off the car, the engine. Off the car. Yeah. Yeah, you'll. And so, of course, it's, it's for 50 years old, and they're, you know, the factory's been out of business for 30 or 40, whatever. And, but I was able to get the build records from the uh, Heritage Foundation, and he accepted that because the numbers did that. Yeah. My, my and he let me get away with it, so I didn't have to put a uh, server, you know, one of the yeah, yeah, it's, it's called that. It's called Arizona State, and I've seen right. it. Yeah. Yeah. several cars at auctions, and you run from those because yeah. Yeah, you're you're stolen. And, and that's and unfortunate, because when you come across, mm -hmm. you know, where we certify stuff, those, those, won't, those won't fly. Uh, so, uh, we want to move along. I want to I want to make a couple of points here. The point in all this, though, you can just read yourself. I'm not going to read them to you. Those terms are extremely dangerous terms. They're very ambiguous. Everybody has their own interpretation of what they mean. There's some more. My question to you is, what's cold? Describe what's cold. It's all subject. Depends on if you live here. Or in Michigan. What's cold? Seriously, what's tall? Tell me what tall is. Give me a definition. What's tall? Like six two, right? Above average. <laughs> you used to be tall. We have back in Illinois, we have a television <laughs> antenna that goes up 1,207 feet. That's tall. Change the paradigm. I change I change everything. 
you have your level of reference. You think tall has to do with people. Perception. Well, I'm not thinking people. I'm thinking tall. I'm thinking antennas. Well, that's tall. Basically, you're what's 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 wide? I know your mother-in-law. <laughs> what's wide? Train tank. That's wide. You come up with all kinds. Of what's authentic? Well, authentic is what you think it is, not necessarily what I think it is. So these are extremely dangerous terms I'm trying to get across. When you see people put this in ads, it almost means nothing. It may mean something. If Kevin described this as preserved, authentic, genuine, are any of those inaccurate? Not really. They are. If you, if you describe this as preserved, authentic, and genuine, is that accurate? Yep. It depends on your definition. Preserved? No, it's not preserved in the sense of it's never been touched. It's been preserved. This might have been done 20 years ago, and it's been preserved beautifully since then. So I, I think it's preserved. It's very dangerous. So it's, it's so ambiguous as to be meaningless. That's the message I want to try to get. You're saying for us to get better educated. You have to know what you're looking at. It doesn't make a difference what it's called. You need to look at it and know in your mind what these definitions mean. We took that 20 years ago. I got tired of this. And I said, I'm going to make my own definitions. I'm going to publish them, and I'm going to put it in the Department, U.S. Department of Commerce and Trade Market. So now, it doesn't mean, doesn't mean I'm right. It has nothing to do with that. It just means I'm talking about TV antennas. Okay? I'm defining tall as 1,200 feet for an antenna. So you might define tall for people. What we did was we put definitions on these different levels of preservation or authenticity. So instead of saying it's preserved, I can say it's survivor certified, and that has a definition to it. And I'll show you what that is. Or it might even be what we call survivor limited. Could be fingerprint, or it could be a xenon. And this is a really, I don't know if you can see it or not, but here's what we do. We look at the automobile, and we say, on a scale of zero to 100%, this is an authenticity or percent of unrestored. Unrestored means unrefinished, unaltered, or modified, or so badly damaged, things are missing. Okay, That's what our definition of authenticity is. You can call it anything you want, but it's the percent of unrestoredness. Is that clear? Everybody got that? Interiors and exteriors. That's everything right now. We, I'm gonna, we would deconstruct this into exterior, interior, underhood, and chassis. But for simplicity, we're going to say the whole car. So if you had a car that was put away in 1965, brought it out of the factory, put it in a, in a, in a humidity control vault, and brought it out today, would you? what percent of authenticity would it be? What percent of unrestoredness would it be? 100%. It would be in the upper right column. It would be 100% unrestored. Now, what if we took the same twin 65, we took it out of the factory, and we set it out in the Arizona desert. And it's been out there since 65. We bring it in today, what's it going to look like? This? How much unrestored is it? It's still 100%, isn't it? So now we've got two cars that are still equal in terms of percentage of unrestoredness, right? Yes. Now we come down to this axis and we look at what's the condition of all the finishes. And they've got to be unrestored. Okay. So we say on this one, how close is this finish on the interior, exterior, engine compartment, underhood, how close are the finishes to the way it left the factory? It's put away for 40, 50 years. What's it going to be? It's going to be 100%, right? So you put where those two come together? Right there. So you can't get better than that. So what we did, we defined it, as long as you've got an automobile that's 51% or more unrestored, and more than 51% of the finishes are still in accurate enough condition that you could use the finish as a model 
to restore a car just like it, the same color. So it's a, if it's set out in the Arizona desert for 40 years, do you think the finish is going to match? No. So it's never been restored, but the finishes won't qualify. So it would be under 50% of its original finish, even though we didn't restore it. So we set the definition, if it's over 51% unrestored, and over 51% of the finishes are still accurate enough we can use as a sample, then you come up to this point, and anything that fits in this box is survivor certified. So when you see an ad that says, this car is survivor certified, what that means to you, whether it's a Superbird, a Corvette, a Packard, an Alpha, you know that car is going to be up in this quadrant. It's that simple. If the car is over here, here's the Arizona car. It's going to be up 100% unrestored, but the finishes are going to be over in this area. So it's going to be an unrestored car with deteriorated finishes. It won't qualify for Survivor, but it's still 100% unrestored. Get it? Car's down here. It's been bastardized, changed, modified blowers and stacks and paint and so forth. So it's going to be down here in terms of authenticity or unrestored. And the finishes aren't accurate anyway. So those are non-original cars with mostly inaccurate finishes. This car over here, it's going to be probably 0% unrestored. But the finishes are great, so it's going to be over here. So these are restored or altered cars with finishes that are mostly accurate. That's how we've divided things so you can look at something and say, what box does it fit in? Does that help you start to, I mean, it makes no difference whether it's a Corvette, an Alpha, a steam locomotive, tractors, more than ever. Yes. How do you contrast this to the FIBA stuff? I don't. It's a long story. Okay, not now. Right. Not now. Okay. Do you ever take this scheme and apply it to different parts of the car, such as mechanical? Yes. yes. When we do this, we actually go to four segments. Okay. Exterior, interior, underhood, and chassis. And to get survivor certified, you have to pass three out of four. Okay. So you can come in with the, we can take, we won't, but we took, we could take Kevin's automobile mm -hmm. and paint it with polka dots, make it green with blue polka dots. It would still qualify survivor because we didn't change 50% of the car. Because there's a lot of surface area in the chassis, the engine, and the interior. So you can get away with quite a bit and still get survivor certified. <coughs> well, if you, oh, I'm sorry. Like I have a 37 Studebaker, mm -hmm. and I went through and I did the brakes, master cylinder, brake lines all the way through the wheel cylinders, got that all done. Uh, Rearched the springs, did those kinds of things. But it's all the right master cylinders. The old master cylinder wasn't repairable. Uh, does that take it out of, is that you, you do your own judging. We're looking at your whole automobile, right? What all did you do to it? Brakes, uh, springs, rearched, fuel, I, uh, new fuel lines, fuel pump, uh, rebuilt the carburetor, same carburetor. Okay. That's it. Could you put all that in the bushel basket? Yeah. Okay. Is the bushel basket, what percentage of, 100% of the car is the bushel basket? Not very small. So what percent of your car still is unrestored? Okay. Probably 95. Okay. You're still, you're still there. You're going to do a lot get the thing down to 50%. Okay. Okay. So we started there in 1990 and say, we just want something to be more than half unrestored and more than half of the finish is still good enough that you could use them as a model to restore a car just like it. That was our definition of, that's pretty good. And we, let the, we put the bar down low enough that you could get a lot of cars to qualify for that. But there's still a lot of cars that don't, especially restored ones. You just can't, you can't restore yourself back into unrestored. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> now, we also had some people who brought in cars like this, and they said, this is a lot better than 50%, 50%. We said, well, that's, that's what you get. You get Survivor. So then we started becoming more definitive, and we created for Survivor Collector Car. Now we have, if you bring in a car that's 30 years old or more, has to be over 30 years old, if you're at 75% unrestored and 75% of your finishes are still accurate, that puts you up in this range, this little block right here. That means it's 75% unrestored, 75% good enough finishes. That's fingerprint certified. So you get your little certificate, 
From us, it's trademark. That means it's 75 percent, 75 percent, and it's over 30 years old. Now I can advertise the Superbird and say I've got a fingerprint certified Superbird. You interested? Maybe. It's a lot more definitive than original Superbird. Okay. So we're just trying to put definition to it. Now, there's still, believe it or not, cars out there that are above 90% unrestored. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of them. Unfortunately, a lot of their finishes oftentimes are not that great. But every now and then you'll find one with 90% of the finish is still good enough that you could use as a, as a model. That puts you up in this little box right here. That's called Zenith. Z-Z-E-N-I-T-H. Means it's got to be 40 years old, 90% unrestored, 90% of the finish is still good enough to use as a model. That is a basically an NOS automobile. And we've got, we've certified 26 of them. 13 the year before, 13 last year. When you come to, to Survivor Collector Car, you walk out on a field and there's 150 new cars sitting out there. Not restored, they're just, it's unbelievable. You can walk around, you see them, you see what history really looks like. And uh, when you see it at the 90% level cars, these are magnificent. I have, I'm not sure where this would fit because I haven't really inspected it. This is probably up in, this is certainly, I would be highly surprised to be a, up in the fingerprint area that probably has a shot at Zenith. So this is, this is a pretty good piece. Can you judge that? Original. <laughs> okay, there's, there's the car, right? There's the car. Where do you put it on the scale? What percent of it is unrestored? 100%. percent We're going so far. We're doing, we're doing okay so far. zero percentage on the finish. Now, how much, what percentage of the finish is still good enough we can use as a sample to restore a 48 Studebaker just like this? Zero. Pretty much down in here, probably. You might get some stuff, maybe in the energy department, if you open the hood and it wasn't exposed to sun, you might pick up some there. So you might be down in here someplace. So that puts you in unrestored car, deteriorated finish. So I could, wrote, I could have written that ad, 100% unrestored original Studebaker for sale. Well, that's a true statement. But what comes to mind versus what you see when you actually walk up and look at it, that, it, that could have saved you a cross-country trip to look at something, <laughs> if that's what you knew you were going to find. So the point is, somebody said earlier, I think you did, when you see these ads, you talk to people, say, oh, I got a such and such. Ask, start asking them questions from a more insightful point of view, and you can triangulate what this person's got. Right. Okay. It's a, it's, you've got to know how to ask the questions. That's right. Educate what questions to ask, which Correct. is a huge, Correct. saves a lot of time. Correct. And carry a piece of paper with you and ask them to sign that. It's remarkable what you will find out by someone who doesn't want to sign something, or the person who says, sure, give it to me, I'll be glad to sign it. I'll be glad to sign all kinds of cars off. Uh, I'll look at this and sign that off. Uh, a lot of it's very doable, so you can do it. Yes, sir. Well, you can use a gauge person, and you call on an ad, and, and you talk to them for a half hour, 45 minutes, and you, you can use a gauge pretty much whether or not you're getting you can, you're, this kind of person. That's a, you, you really can't. The, the exception to that that I, that I caution my clients on is sometimes the person, quite frankly, is so far out of the loop they can't tell you, and they don't mean not oh, to tell you. They, but they got it. They, their right. their their persons did it. You know, the shop did it. They put it in the trailer for the guy. He flies out in the jet. Watch the car shows up. You know, here's my such and such. And then when you call up, you know, he's taking his restorer's word for it or his shop's word for it. He doesn't. Uh, uh, I've seen too many of them. They don't have a clue, and they don't really mean not to. They just don't. So you can usually gauge that too. Yeah. So <laughs> well, they don't tell you. I mean, if they tell you, they're honest about it. Yeah, they do. Yeah. What's that? Other than Mustang. Lots of chips and stuff in here. Where is the, you got the super, super high frequency Hector Fluger on antenna. Where is it? On oh, unrestored. What do you think? No. No. It's a dead on. Yep, that's that, real. Is that lime gold? Is that a lime gold car? I'm not a Mustang person. I really it looked too green to me. It's pretty green. This is what I'm sure. Oh, here's the picture. That's an original 
color. Yeah. That's, 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 that's the original color. We haven't seen that. Yeah, color. Well, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's the original color. The photograph that represents so then, is not being rare. even close to the color. Rare, or this is my specialty. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> finishes and see the goofy antenna? Yeah, no, it's, what it's difference does that make? That. But it has the original uh, base. Uh, somebody uh, even if it didn't, yeah. we could drill the base out or hit it with a hammer. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Still doesn't make any difference. Exactly. And that's why people say, well, I'm worried. I mean, we get two kinds of people call it. We get the one kind of person who calls up and says, I've got this car, but I'm really kind of afraid to bring it because I don't know if it will qualify. It's kind of like somebody's question over here. I think it was your question. I don't know if I can bring it. I'm not sure it will qualify. Well, what have you done to it? Well, replace the air cleaner lid. Anything else? Yeah, battery. I had to replace the battery. What else? The tires. Oil. So, and the oil. And so I replaced the air cleaner lid, the tires, and the battery, and I don't know if I qualify or not. Because people don't have perspective yet. Put it in perspective of that 100%. Can you put it in a bushel basket? Yeah. Well, that's not 10%. 20 percent, you know, that's, that's a tiny percent. Okay, I think I got it. And then you get people calling up and say, I want to come in here, car and uh, survivor collector, I want to get one of those Zenith awards. <laughs> all original? Yeah, all original. <laughs> How about the exterior? Oh, yeah. So has it ever been repainted? Yeah, we got brand new original paint on it. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm not making this up. This is what they say. How about the interior? All original. Is it any marks? No, no, it's brand new. Just, <laughs> just it brand new Elmont interior, it's gorgeous. That's their definition of original. So they still don't understand what original means. So again, beating into your heads, you've got to be really careful of these definitions because they're just they're just so loose. Yes, sir. If you had a pretty decent car, but uh, did move an original interior from another car. That's called transplanting. Yeah. Now, now, I mean, if it's if the build sheet on the car says it has tan leather, number 212, and then you find a, a really nice 212 leather interior for another car, the interior doesn't have any serial numbers, and you put it in this car, and then they bring it to you, and you can't distinguish between whether it's for transplanting. That's right. Are you, are you, could you potentially get that car as well? You absolutely would. Now, unless you put it in upside down, <laughs> and you put the front seat covers in the back, you screwed up the insulation so bad. Uh, uh, no. Absolutely do that. Yeah, People do that all the time. It's called re-original. That's a new term I invented. <laughs> I simply made it re-original. Because it is original, it just came from over there. That's not to be confused with re-unrestored. <laughs> re unrestored. Put that in your notebook. It's been re unrestored. Are you saying you think that's fair to call that? Is that transplant allowed within your standards? Or if yes. you know it and you shoot it dead? No, no, because it's done in the spirit. And the Smithsonian would do the same thing. If we have, if in the Smithsonian, if we're doing an airplane or a vehicle, uh, it's far better than putting a replacement interior in it. So the whole idea is not to fool somebody. And I always tell people, I think I told Keith this, or Kevin this morning, if you're going to do something like that, put it in the logbook. Create a logbook and say, here's what we did. That's such and such a thing. And you make history out of it. You, it. you build the story to it. It increases your credibility. I want to, I want to move on to this one. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I tend to buy all on your store cars. And one of the first things I do, almost every single one of them is to take my upholster. And I have the stuff, the seats, meaning the original upholstery because the stuffing is just all gone to hell and you're sitting on it. Is that unoriginal now that I have new stuffing it, in there? Yeah, technically speaking, yes, but it won't make any difference in terms of, because it's such a small percent, okay. it won't make that much difference. If it were me or the Smithsonian, you get you log it in. Now, if there was something really, truly historic about that car, if it raced a Lamar or did oh, something really special, you yeah. just leave it alone, let the seats be saggy, because yeah, yeah. it's now become a, you know, it's a, it's a treasure at that point. And, you, and again, you have to use some common sense in this. You can't just go nuts and, and preserve everything that's, that's kind of silly on a, a 62 Ford, four-door, you know, who cares? You can just you know, use common sense. But if you've got a, a national treasure that's really something important, that's what you really want to be careful. Real quick, this car right here. Would that, would that qualify for a survivor or not? 
Or do you have enough information? I think that car should qualify for Survivor if you judge in four categories. Because if it's totally original except a one repaint, that's the balance of my question. Exactly I think that's right. the biggest thing you're going to find. A lot of cars out there, people say it's original. They may have just repainted the car once and not touched anything else. So that's probably something your biggest Yeah, and that's, that, that is okay because we go through the process with the exterior. We judge the exterior by itself. We judge the interior, engine department, and chassis. All four components have to pass that test. Is A, is it unrestored, or what percent is unrestored? As long as over half of it is, it's okay. As long as half the finishes are still okay, it passes. So the interior passed on this one, hasn't been touched. Engine passed, chassis passed. Exterior, failed. But you got three out of four, that's over 50%, you get survivor certified. And you could have showed us that Corvette right there with its original paint untouched, they left the dealership undercoated on the bottom. We don't see it, but it's exactly the same thing, it, right? It's That's right. Three yeah, four. Absolutely right. It's just we wouldn't yeah. even see it in that picture. Right. But you you would you would never qualify for Zeno. That's right. the problem. Right. Indeed. But we also, it's not. We we're trying to get across the idea. This is not a car show. It's not a contest. It's just when you get on the scales at the doctor's office, it reads what it reads. And that's all we can do for you is we just read the standard. We just read what it is, and we say to you, "Yeah, you got three out of four. Here's what here's what it is." And it's a standard that if you advertise, I got a fingerprint award. She knows that you're not ninety percent, ninety percent, but she also knows you're above yeah. survivor level too. So she's got you in that box up there, that gray box, which is fingerprint. Now I got a rough idea. Now it might be worth my plane ticket to come out and actually look at it, or send it to somebody who knows what they're doing. Especially is. It's a very interesting one. Cadillac. How do you think that would do? Not enough information. Right. Why, Mark? What else do you need to know? Three tall paint job, there. All four aspects. You know. Okay. Well, the interior is dead on. It's okay. Take my word. Chassis, chassis is great. Interior. Uh, it's the engine compartment. Great. What do you think? Wrong color? Color change? It was green. Okay. Uh, it was green. And we know that because we lift the hood, we can see traces of it. Okay. As a matter of fact, the door jams are still green. Three of four. Three of four. He could have painted any color he wanted to. Now, but if he kept it green and didn't paint the door jams, or let's say he. In, well, speaking of Corvette talk, let's say he repainted the car, huh? but he, and he sprayed the door jams and everything flat. He kept it flat. Would that give you more points as opposed to the color change? No, you, no. you've repainted it. So it's, it's a, if you're going to repaint it, you can repaint it any color you want. Because if you paint it accurately or with polka dots, it won't make any difference. Right. You've changed the finish. You've modified that. So you change the finish. It's done. That's why I'm saying to you, don't paint things if you can possibly get away with it. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. Will that car get Survivor? No. Why? Because the driver died. Because you're going to lose out at least three. You might get the interior pass, but everything Tell else. Tell me what's been restored. Of course, it's been restored. I don't know about it. That's all original. It's going to need it. That's not the question. The question is what percentage of it is unrestored? Yeah, but it's not all what percentage of it? 100%. 100%. 100 percent unrestored. That's a true statement. It's got an all original chassis, all original interior, all original exterior. That's a totally authentic. It isn't, but I'm telling you it is. Okay. <laughs> Believe me. That's totally authentic. So where's it going to score on that vertical scale for unrestored? 100 It's not the way it left the factory. Uh, we're not talking about that. <laughs> this is not a car show. It's simply two things. What percentage is unrestored? See, I think you brought up a good point when you said, could you use the surface color to make sure that color's right on that car? Could that this is car an be archival, used? This is an right. archival Smithsonian question. It's the only one in the world that ever existed. That's it. Right. Forget that it's a Corvette. It's a, it's a right. Howard Hughes uncovered car that nobody ever knew about. That's it. So is it 100% authentic or excuse me, 100% unrestored? Yes, yeah. it is. Can all the, can more than fifty percent of the finishes, or seventy-five or ninety percent of the finishes, be used as a as a model? Yeah, yes, they can. So here you have a very interesting piece. It cannot be survivor certified because I didn't tell you one of the other requirements you've got to be to be survivor certified. 
You've got to drive it. <laughs> it has to be able to run. It has to pass the road test. So could it be survivor certified? No. But this is Howard Hughes's car that he hit somebody in, and that's the damage he did to it three days after it was brand new. It's a historic piece. Do you restore it? No. no. So now here's a great example. You bring it to Survivor Collector Car, go after that Zenith, and, well, I gotta restore it so I can win a prize. No, you have a historic piece here. This is not a car, this is no longer a car. It's an antique, it's a, it's a, it's a treasure that just happens to look like an automobile. That's a hard thing to readjust to. From a Smithsonian point of view, that would go in, archived, documented, that's what it is. It's a piece of history. Now, that is not for any real purpose other than to get you to see the extremes that you need to work with when you're talking about preservation. If you're buying a, a 1972, I don't even know if they made them dusters. Yeah, the dusters. Okay, something they made 20 million of, and you've got that. Really, it's not going to make much difference. But if you've got something that's extremely rare or unusual, the temptation is I've got to go fix I have to fix that. Well, let's suppose that happened at Le Mans with someone famous driving it. Or, no, that then becomes your personal decision. Do I want to do that or do I want to capture the time in history when XYZ happened? I'm not here to tell you yes or no, but I want to get you to think about all the different ways you can do preservation. It's very interesting and lots of fun. Uh, a couple things we've already talked about. Reversibles, there is a way to put paint on that you can take it back off again. Microcrystal paint can be done. Microcrystal and wax, excuse me. Uh, we're actually going to do a collector car conference, which you can maybe look forward to if you want. We're actually going to teach people how to do this. We'll actually teach you how to take an unrestored car and care for it. How, how things to do, not to do. How to bring finishes back without room. So we're going to talk about all those kinds of things. We originally we've already talked about it's transplanted from one to the other. Re unrestored. That's where somebody has the valve covers chrome and they never were chrome to begin with. So the person takes them off, takes all the stripping off, or takes all the chrome off spray paints it, then uses lacquer thinner and ovens and iced tea and so forth to get all the stuff dulled down and baked and aged. What they're doing there is re-unrestoring it. It's unrestored at one time, they screwed it up, and now they're re-unrestoring it. And I suggest don't do that because you'll never get it right. You'll never make it match the rest of its community. So if we re-unrestore something inside the engine compartment here. Uh, yeah, we've got the, uh, the, air, the uh, fuel injection lid. We could re-unrestore that and make it look more period, but it will not deteriorate at the same rate everything else has. So as time goes by, it'll get even further out of sync. And so the first thing I see when I walk up to something like that is I can say, you know, you just, you just did something to its history and you made it even worse. So that's the thing we don't suggest you do is re-underscore. Yeah. Yes. Right. Just transplant. Yeah. Yes. Right. Because it looks silly. Unless you're really good. Smithsonian can do it, but then they also log it. Smithsonian doesn't do anything to mislead. They, they put in a log book and they say, here's what you did. Common mistakes that you're going to make or people do is refinish it. Be very careful of that. A priority on cosmetic perfection versus historic perfection. Compulsion to paint, polish. Everybody wants to do that. Accidentally ruining finishes by overcleaning. Throwing things away that I didn't think I was going to use anymore. Uh, and trying to back up, trying to restore it back into unrestored. Don't do it. And trusting the wrong experts. There's lots of them out there. Be very careful when you're talking. Uh, we've eaten up our time. We've gone over a few minutes. What have we not covered that you want to? I don't want to take everybody else's time up. I'll stay here until 3 o'clock if you want me to. We've got two more days of this to go. You know, three. Where do we get the cars judged for Survivor? We run an event every year. Uh, this year it's June 26th. I have a couple brochures if you want to take a look at them. June 26th, St. Charles, Illinois. And we, we certify Survivor and um, Fingerprint and Zeno. It's every year. West Coast at all? Uh, not yet. We're thinking about doing that, but we're... We have cars out here, too. <laughs> <laughs> no other coach. One, one of the reasons we don't do that yet is because we're very picky about who the inspectors are. 
You can't just have anybody out of the woodwork judging these things. You've got to have people that really know what they're doing. And so we don't just say, hey, you want to be a judge today? It's not that like we interview people, we test them, and we really figure out what are they looking at. We don't really want Corvette experts or Packard experts. We want forensic people who can look at deterioration rates and say, I don't care what kind of a car that is, that is not deteriorated at the same rate this is. Something's been going on there. So we're looking much deeper than brands. We're not looking for trophies. We're looking for, is it forensically in, in sync? We do that June 26th. It's called Survivor Collector Car. The website is survivorcollectorcar.com. You go there and see all about the stuff. It's pretty helpful. There's all kinds of stuff there. I'll be glad to talk about this. I don't want to do this as a commercial. If you want to talk about it, I'll, I'll be glad to visit with you about that. Yeah, in the yeah, President Ron. St. Charles, Illinois, President Ron. Do yes. you have to make an appointment? Be certified? I've got the 65 and I'd like to you know, see it. Yeah, yeah, certified. Well, you see it for passage, you bring it up and it goes through it. And you have the right, I don't have to call in Yes, you do. You have to register it. It opens February 15th and it's limited to 100 cars. Last year we sold out in two weeks. What's the charge? For? It's expensive. Well, it's, it's expensive for people who don't know what this is yet. I think it's 400 bucks. Uh, but it's in the Corvette world, it's up to 1400. But when you do it to get the credibility, people say it's worth it. They, they say that's a lot of money here. It's a lot of money. So, but they also know that what it does to the credibility is. A group of 15 extremely knowledgeable people saying to you, here's what this is. And it's no longer you saying it. It's somebody else. That, that does have some value. Uh, yes? Two real quick questions. Two quick questions. Number one, on vehicles that are over 50 years old, and you have to do something mechanical like rebuild the transmission and then it goes back in. How does that affect it? We can't then, see it. Okay. Number two, over 50 years old cars that don't have seat belts and you have to drill a hole in the floor to get don't a seat belt. Tiny, okay. such, such a tiny percent. Do such and such, such a tiny percent. Yes, sir. Uh, exterior is 25%. Uh, is exterior is right word. That's Exterior, no. Exterior is everything when you lift the body off the chassis. Not the wheels, not the chassis, not the interior, not the engine. Everything you see here is one big shell, that's the exterior. This, this glass chrome, so if you repaint it. Uh, what I'm leading to is, let's say we've got an incredibly well-preserved car. Right where it was originally was They do in fact paint it. That will be, that's just one more. They'll never get the zero? Never get the zero. In other words, that paint job alone does bring it down. It brings it down a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, David.